to the fair. Fall fairs have been a feature of North American life since early in the 19th century. At the end of the harvest, people from rural areas have come together to celebrate. Usually, these fairs take the form of a competition regarding the best of all farm products of that year. Depending on the part of the country and its most important crop, fall fairs can begin as early as August or as late as November. They usually last several days. When the United States and Canada were organized, they were divided into small units called counties. Larger units were called states or provinces. Many of the best-known fairs are county fairs or state fairs. There are also smaller local fairs and larger ones too, like the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, Ontario. Since these fairs are usually annual events, many have developed permanent buildings over the years. Most of these are large barn-like structures. These buildings are used to display new products for farm life, such as tractors, home furnishings, and water systems. Several barns are usually necessary to house all the horses, cows, pigs, goats, sheep, chickens, and other animals in competition. There must also be room to display all the vegetables, berries, and fruits in competition. Finally, there is space for handicrafts, artwork, baked goods, and jams and jellies. Usually, there is a grandstand, which is a stage with wooden seats around it. Here, entertainers perform for an audience during the fair. Country and western singers are usually popular at fairs, but so are comedians, clowns, dancers, and musicians. There may also be other contests, such as a beauty competition for queen of the fair, tests of strength for the men, or pie-eating events. Most fairs also have a race track, which is used for horse racing, or in some cases, auto racing. Fairs have helped to improve animal breeds, and races encourage the breeding of fast horses. Plowing contests test the strength and steadiness of horses, and so do pulling contests. This spirit of competition has led to improvements in all areas of farming. Every kind of grain, fruit, vegetable, berry, and animal is tested, and only the best win a ribbon. This encourages fairness to improve their products. Farm women compete to produce the best homemade food and crafts. Many kinds of fruit and vegetables are stored in glass jars for the winter. The best of these also receive prizes. Most fairs have a dining area where there is good food served to the public. The goal of improving farming is sponsored by the governments of Canada and the USA. 4-H clubs are youth organizations that encourage farm children to take an interest in farming. 4-H clubs aim at improving the heads, hearts, hands, and health of their members. There are also women's organizations, such as the Women's Institutes in Canada, which work to make the life of farm families better. Fall fairs have taken over the idea of the midway from the circus. The midway has rides like Ferris wheels, merry-go-rounds, and roller coasters. It also has games of chance and skill, such as trying to throw a small hoop over a large bottle. One nice thing about fall fairs is that they are fun for the whole family. Children enjoy the midway and the farm animals. Women like the crafts, food, and household exhibits. Men like the machinery, the horse races, and the crop exhibits. Everyone likes the grandstand shows. Nowadays, not so many people live on farms, but people from towns and cities still enjoy going to fall fairs. They are part of our North American heritage. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is one of the world's leading tourist attractions. Millions of people around the world visit here each year. Summers at the falls are especially busy, with traffic jams and parking problems. However, the falls are beautiful in winter too. Many have asked why people travel so far to see water falling over a cliff. The size and beauty of Niagara Falls help to make it special. While many falls are higher than Niagara, very few are as wide or have such a volume of water. It also helps that Niagara is relatively easy to travel to. When the first Europeans came to Niagara, the falls were surrounded by forest, 
The noise of the falls could be heard miles away before they were actually seen. The first visitors were filled with horror at the sight. Later, fear ceased to be the main emotion inspired by the falls. Later, visitors were impressed by the beauty and grandeur of the falls, which overwhelmed them with wonder. By the 1830s, people were able to come to the falls by railway. As more and more people came, the tourist industry developed. Early tourism was not well regulated, and there were many complaints about cheats and swindles. Today, there are similar complaints about tourist junk and high prices. The majority of tourists stay on the Canadian side. There are two falls separated by an island. Since the Niagara River forms the boundary here between Canada and the United States, each country has one of the falls. The Canadian Horseshoe Falls is wider and more impressive than the American Rainbow Falls. About nine times more water goes over the Canadian Falls. Nonetheless, there is much to be seen on the American side. The island in the middle, Goat Island, is one of the best places to view the falls and rapids. It is on the American side. Newly married couples began coming to Niagara Falls when it was still a secluded, peaceful, and romantic spot. It is still popular with newlyweds as a relatively inexpensive and convenient place to spend their honeymoon. Besides being beautiful, Niagara Falls is also very useful. Their falling water is the power behind several of the largest hydroelectric stations in the world. Much of the electric power used in this part of North America comes from Niagara Falls. In order to harness this power, half of the flow of water is channeled away from the falls during the night and during the non tourist season. Probably most visitors don't notice the difference. Niagara has attracted many kinds of people over the years. Businessmen have come to profit from the tourists. Daredevils have come to make a name for themselves. Some have gone over the falls in a barrel, while others have walked above the falls on a tightrope. Poets and artists have visited here to capture its beauty. Lovers have come to gaze on its romantic scenery. All of these and many others have helped to make Niagara Falls world famous. George W. Bush, Jr. George W. Bush, Jr. was inaugurated as the 43rd President of the United States on January 20, 2001. Of course, people knew that he was the son of the 41st President, George H. W. Bush. He had also been Governor of Texas since 1994. However, aside from this, he was not very well known outside of Texas. Why then did so many people want him to run for president in 2000? Many Republicans thought that the Democrats could be defeated in 2000, but they themselves lacked a candidate with strong appeal. As the election approached, leading Republicans worried about whom to support. Some of the most powerful Republicans were state governors. They began to look around at each other for a possible candidate. Most eyes turned to George W. Bush, the governor of Texas. In November 1998, Bush was re-elected as governor by an impressive margin. By now, Bush was the leading Republican candidate in the polls. Of course, one advantage that Governor Bush had was a familiar name. In fact, when he did well in some early polls, it is likely that some people really voted for his father. They thought that George H.W. Bush was running again. The Bush family was able to swing a lot of support to George W. It also helped that his brother Jeb was now governor of Florida. Parents George and Barbara were both born in eastern United States, but in 1948, George moved to Texas where he made a fortune in the oil business. He went into politics in the 1960s and 70s and served in a number of important positions. He was Ronald Reagan's vice president from 1981 to 1989 and president from 1989 to 1993. George W. was born in 1946, the oldest of the Bush children. Three more brothers and two sisters were also born. The youngest sister died of leukemia as a child. George W. attended the same prestigious eastern colleges as his father. Then he came back to Texas and was a fighter pilot with the Texas Air National Guard. During the early 70s, he wandered from place to place trying different jobs. 
After attending Harvard Business School from 1972 to 1975, he came back to Texas and started his own oil exploration company. Although it wasn't as profitable as his father's company, he eventually sold his stock shares for a considerable amount of money. In 1978, he ran for the Senate of the United States, but was defeated. He became closely involved in his father's campaign for president in 1988. Here, he developed a lot of the political skills he was later able to use to run for office himself. In 1989, back in Texas, George W. organized a group that bought the Texas Rangers baseball team. He later sold the team in 1998 and made a $14 million profit. In 1994, he surprised the political world by defeating the incumbent governor of Texas. As governor, he pushed ahead with an energetic program, which reflected neoconservative values. However, George W. did not appear as an ideologist to people. Even his opponents were willing to work with him. When he ran for president in 2000, Bush described himself as a compassionate conservative. Only time will tell how successful Bush will be as U.S. president. Ireland Ireland is an island in the Atlantic Ocean, just west of Britain. For much of its history, it has been an advantage to Ireland to be far from the mainland. The Romans or the other early empires never conquered Ireland. It was the remoteness of Ireland that helped preserve much of Christian and classical culture. After the fall of the Roman Empire, wandering tribes destroyed much of what remained on the continent. Finally, it was Ireland's turn to be invaded. First, the Norsemen, or Vikings, attacked during the 800s and 900s. Then, in the 1100s, the English invaded Ireland. Since that time, there has always been an English presence in Ireland. The conflict between the English and the Irish grew worse in the 1500s. Then the English became Protestant, and the Irish remained Catholic. In the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell tried to make Ireland Protestant by driving out the Catholics and bringing in Protestant settlers. In the centuries following, Irish Catholics had very few rights in their own country. The Catholic Irish were not allowed to vote until 1829. Since Irish Catholics were not allowed to own land, they were poor tenant farmers. They paid rent to the English landlords. The main food crop in the 1840s was potatoes. When these became infected by blight, thousands of Irishmen starved. Many others were evicted from their dwellings because they couldn't pay the rent. Hundreds of thousands of Irish took ship for North America. The Catholic Irish preferred to go to the United States because Canada was under British influence. However, many Protestant Irish went to Canada. The influence of the Irish on North American culture has been very great in many areas. Prominent Irish Americans include Presidents John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. Meanwhile, in Ireland itself, a strong independence movement developed. A rebellion against England in 1916 began a struggle that resulted in independence for most of Ireland. Some Protestant areas in Northern Ireland preferred to stay with England. Republican groups such as the Irish Republican Army wanted to liberate the North from British rule. Nowadays, conflict between Protestants and Catholics is limited to these northern counties. Constant attempts are being made to bring the conflict there to an end. Meanwhile, the Irish Republic of Air has become prosperous again. It can sell its agricultural products to the European common market. Irish beer and whiskey are sold all over the world. Ireland is also becoming known for its high-tech industries. Because of this relative prosperity, the population is increasing again after a century and a half of decline. The Irish differ from other people because the vast majority of Irishmen live away from their homeland. However, this exodus from Ireland has helped to spread Irish music, culture, and products around the world. On St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, nearly everyone becomes Irish for the day. Then there is a great party with Celtic music, Irish dancing, green beer, and the wearing of the green. Niagara on the Lake Niagara on the Lake is a little town at the mouth of the Niagara River. It is only 12 miles north of Niagara Falls. It used to be true that very few tourists would bother to travel from the falls down to Niagara-on-the-Lake. Nowadays, however, the little town itself is a major tourist attraction. 
The town has a remarkable history. The area played an important role in both the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. As a result, the little town has two forts: Fort George and Fort Mississauga. When Fort George was reconstructed for the public in the 1930s, Niagara on the Lake got its first big tourist attraction. Because Niagara on the Lake was the first capital of Ontario, it has many significant firsts. There was the first parliament in the province, the first legal society, the first library, the first newspaper, the first museum building, and many more firsts. Besides its history, the town, which is bordered by Lake Ontario and the Niagara River, has beautiful scenery. On a summer's day, visitors can watch the sailboats going out the river to the lake. On the land side, Niagara is part of the fruit belt of Ontario. Peaches, pears, apples, cherries, and strawberries grow here in abundance. There are also long rows of vines, and winemaking has recently become a major industry. The mild, humid climate allows plants to flourish. The trees, especially the oaks, grow to remarkable heights. Flowering trees and shrubs perfume the air in the spring. Gardens are often spectacular for much of the year. Because of this, Niagara on the Lake attracts many painters and photographers. Many of the private homes also have a long history, and great care is taken to keep them looking their best. The biggest single attraction is the Shaw Festival Theater. The festival was founded in 1962 by a group of Shaw enthusiasts. Early productions were often held in the historic courthouse on the main street, and plays still take place there. In 1973, however, a new 861-seat Shaw Theater was built at the south end of town. Since then, traffic to Niagara on the Lake has been steady all through the long summer season. In 1996, Niagara on the Lake was voted the prettiest town in Canada. Partly, it is the scale of things that makes the old town so attractive. The old town is only about eight blocks long by eight blocks wide. It has a population of little more than 1,000 people. Nonetheless, there is a lot for people to do and see. There are many interesting shops, old hotels, bookstores, art galleries, museums, a golf course, a marina, historic churches and cemeteries, several parks, three theaters, and lots of restaurants. Because it is small, Niagara on the Lake is a good place to walk around or bicycle around. There are also horse and wagon rides. Although the main street can be hectic in tourist season, one doesn't have to go far off the main street to get in touch with an older, slower time. Most of the downtown buildings haven't changed much since the days of Queen Victoria, and tourists can still imagine that they are back in the days before computers and television. Paul Kane, frontier artist. Since Christopher Columbus first met American Indians in 1492. Many Europeans had been fascinated by Indian life and culture. As a result, there was a demand in Europe for drawings and paintings of Native Americans. European artists who had never seen an Indian supplied most of this demand. But in the 19th century, several painters traveled into Indian territory to make an authentic record of Native life. One of the first artists to do this was the American painter George Catlin. In 1841, Catlin published a book of his work. Catlin's work helped inspire another important frontier artist, the Canadian Paul Kane. Paul Kane was born in Ireland in 1810. His family moved to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, when Paul was nine years old. The young boy was not very interested in school. At that time, there were still Indians living in wigwams in the Toronto area. Young Paul liked visiting the Indian village instead of going to school. Since Paul spent little time in school, he was largely a self-taught artist. He also became a surprisingly good writer, considering that he had not spent much time studying spelling or grammar. After working some years making and decorating furniture, Cain was ready to travel. He spent the years from 1836 to 1841 living and traveling in the United States. Then he traveled in Europe from 1841 to 1843, studying the great painters of the past. He was back in the USA until 1845, and then he returned to Toronto. 
Immediately upon his return, Cain headed into the wilderness areas around Georgian Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Lake Michigan. His plan was to sketch Indian life before it disappeared forever. American Indians were dying so rapidly from European diseases, such as measles and smallpox, that many people believed they would soon vanish as a race. Their culture was threatened, too. As white settlers demanded more land, Indians were being herded into small pieces of land called reservations. Here they could no longer practice their traditional way of life. Cain wanted to capture Native American life while it still existed. Cain returned to Toronto at the end of 1845. He had received one good piece of advice, and that was if he wanted to travel into the wilderness, he would have to go with experienced people. He was able to get the support of the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Sir George Simpson. In May 1846, Cain joined the annual canoe fleet of fur traders going west. Cain would travel all through the wilderness areas of western Canada and northwestern USA. During this time, he made hundreds of sketches of Indian life. Although Cain faced incredible hardships during his travels, he was able to see what he wanted to see. He was able to take part in one of the last great buffalo hunts and killed two large bison himself. Traveling west with the fur traders, he visited many forts and trading posts. He saw and painted a prairie fire. He shot a grizzly bear at close range and killed several wolves that attacked his horses. He learned to travel long distances on snowshoes in winter. Finally, he arrived at the Pacific coast, where he made some fine drawings of the West Coast Indians. European diseases had reached there just before Cain. Fifteen hundred Indians had died near Fort Vancouver in the summer of 1848. One wealthy chief had ruled one thousand warriors and had ten wives, four children, and eighteen slaves. Now he had only one wife, one child, and two slaves. Cain had not come too soon. However, there were tribes still unaffected by Western culture and Western diseases. Cain also traveled widely around the Columbia River in northwestern USA. Everywhere he went, he sketched Indian chiefs and scenes of native life. On his return trip, he encountered a large war party of 1,500 braves on the warpath against their traditional enemies. He was able to sketch the leading chief, Big Snake, who was later killed in single combat during the battle. When he arrived back in Toronto, Cain gave an exhibit of his sketches and watercolors. Most of the rest of his life was spent turning these drawings into finished paintings. Pocahontas and John Smith In 1606, King James of England approved the establishment of two colonies along the eastern coast of America. The northern colony in Maine lasted only a year. The southern one at Jamestown in Virginia became England's first permanent settlement in America. In 1607, the Virginia Company sent 104 settlers to Virginia. The settlers lived in tents all summer. By September, more than 60 were dead because they lacked good food or water. The leaders of the colony were not energetic and did little to make the settlers find food. One member of the company, Captain John Smith, was determined that the colony would survive. Smith pressured the colonists to build huts, a storehouse, and a church. He made daring trips to Indian villages, demanding that they give the settlers food in return for beads and copper. He threatened settlers who were trying to leave the colony and go back to England. On one of his trips to the interior, Indians attacked John Smith. They killed his two companions, but captured him alive. He was taken first to the local chief. This chief was impressed by Smith's compass and spared his life. His captors dragged Smith from village to village. He finally arrived at the town belonging to Powhatan. Powhatan was a great chief for all of the tribes in that region. Powhatan and his advisors talked about what to do with Smith. Suddenly, Smith was dragged forward, and his head was pushed against a stone. The warriors raised their clubs to kill Smith. Then Pocahontas, who was Powhatan's twelve-year-old daughter, begged for his life. Her words had no effect, so Pocahontas ran to Smith. She took his hand in her arms and laid her own head against his head. Smith was released and went back to Jamestown. Soon after Smith returned, one hundred new settlers from England arrived. It was a very cold winter, and in January, Jamestown was accidentally set on fire. The settlers suffered from cold and hunger the rest of the winter. 
Every four or five days, Pocahontas and her attendants came. They brought food for the hungry settlers. Even so, half of them died. In the summer, John Smith explored that part of the coast of America. He made a map that would be very valuable for future sailors and settlers. On his return, Smith was elected leader of the colony at Jamestown. However, some settlers did not like having to follow rules. Some encouraged the Indians to try to kill Smith. Chief Powhatan agreed. He also refused to supply food to the colony, hoping to starve them out. Pocahontas warned Smith about the plot against his life. Smith had to fight off several attempts to kill him. Finally, the colony seemed to be growing, and the Indians became peaceful. But in late 1609, Smith was injured in an explosion and returned to England. Pocahontas remained a friend to the colony. She married John Rolfe, one of the settlers. In 1616, she traveled to England with her husband and son. There she saw John Smith once again. She was so surprised to see him that she was unable to speak for several days. Pocahontas had believed that Smith was dead. The following year, she died and was buried in England. Pocahontas' love for Smith and Smith's determination to fight for the colony had saved Jamestown and given the English their first colony in America. Gribio St. Francis of Assisi, who lived in Italy in the early 13th century, was known for his love of animals. He was the first person who celebrated the birth of Jesus by gathering live animals around a manger. He often talked to the birds as he traveled along. Sometimes the birds would fly down and sit on his head, shoulders, knees, and arms. But the best-known animal story concerns St. Francis and the wolf of Gribio. St. Francis was known for his humility and his unwillingness to hurt anyone. Once, when one of his followers spoke harshly to some bandits, St. Francis told the man to run after the bandits and apologize. In the same way, St. Francis thought of animals as his brothers and sisters. Once, when he was warned about some dangerous wolves, he replied that he had never harmed Brother Wolf and didn't expect the wolf to harm him. While St. Francis was staying in the hill town of Gribio, he heard about a large, fierce wolf. The townspeople were terrified of this wolf and had eaten both domestic animals and humans. St. Francis decided to help the people and went out to talk to the wolf. The people watched in horror as the wolf came running to attack St. Francis. But the saint made the sign of the cross. Then he said to the wolf that, in the name of Jesus, it should stop hurting people. The wolf then lay down at St. Francis's feet. St. Francis addressed a little sermon to the wolf. He recounted all the terrible things that the wolf had done, but he added that he wanted to make peace between the wolf and the townspeople. The wolf nodded its head in approval. In return for the wolf's agreement to keep the peace, St. Francis promised him that he would arrange for the townspeople to feed him. When he asked the wolf never again to harm any person or animal, the wolf nodded again. Then the wolf put out its paw as a sign that it would keep its promise. The wolf walked beside St. Francis back into Gribio. When a crowd assembled, the saint preached to them about how God had allowed the wolf to terrify them because of their sins. He told them to repent, and God would forgive them. Then he spoke of the promise that the wolf had made, and what he had promised the wolf in return. The people agreed to feed the wolf regularly, and the wolf again indicated that it would not hurt anyone. Again, it put its paw in St. Francis's hand. The wolf and the people kept the agreement. Two years later, the wolf died. The people remembered how it no longer hurt anyone, and that not a single dog ever barked at it. The townspeople of Gribio lamented its death. Whenever it went through town, it had reminded them of the virtues and holiness of St. Francis. Telephone Systems When Alexander Graham Bell developed the telephone in the 1870s, it was fairly simple to use. You talked into the mouthpiece and then held it to your ear to listen. For a century or so, using the telephone meant either contacting the operator to dial a number or dialing yourself. After that, all you had to do was talk or listen. Nowadays, the telephone has become a very complex instrument. It rivals the computer as to the number of possible uses. Answering machines have been around for several decades, but they are now being replaced by voicemail. Voicemail does away with the need for an answering machine. Messages are stored on the system. 
That means it's possible to forward the message to someone else's phone or transfer the call to a more convenient phone of your own. You can also use call pickup so that anyone on your group can answer another's phone. Conference calls have become very common. This is when one person phones first one person, then another, and keeps adding people to the telephone conversation. This can regularly be done with up to six people. It is very useful for business discussions where different people need to talk about the same thing. It also speeds up the process of consensus and allows everybody to be in on the decision or discussion. The modern phone has many more features. If you don't want the caller to know what is being said in your office, you can push the mute button. If you want to hang up without putting the receiver down, press goodbye. If you don't want to receive calls, just forward them all into your voicemail. Newer phones will indicate when you have voicemail messages. If you have trouble with these features, an automatic voice will tell you your options. This help system is built into the telephone. For example, the help voice will tell you how to set up a distribution list so that you can send the same voice message to a number of people. It will also tell you how to send a message directly into someone's voicemail. You can designate your message to go to the top of the recipient's voicemail list. You can also program it so that the recipient cannot forward it. Some systems have limits on how much space can be used for individual voicemail. There are a number of courtesies that voicemail users should follow. Your greeting on your voicemail should be simple. If you are unable to take calls for any reason, you might want to explain that in your recorded greeting. If you are on vacation, you might want to include that information in your greeting. Don't use voicemail as a way to avoid answering the telephone. Some people use voicemail to screen calls. This can be annoying to someone who can never contact you directly. Check your messages regularly and reply to them promptly. Enjoy the telecommunications revolution. The Ford Pinto Case Businessmen often complain that their profits are negatively affected by government regulations. On the other hand, history has proven that it is necessary to regulate business in at least one area, public safety. There is ample evidence that consideration for the safety of the public is not always a priority in business decisions. Back in 1912, the Titanic smashed into an iceberg, killing hundreds of people. It was going too fast through a large collection of icebergs while attempting to set a speed record. Unfortunately, there were not enough lifeboats to accommodate the passengers. Usually, when such a tragedy occurs, the company is not found guilty. Instead, safety regulations are enacted for future cases. In the future, ships were ordered to carry a sufficient supply of lifeboats. In 1978, the Ford Motor Company was indicted on the charge of homicide. This was the first time such a charge had been brought against an American corporation. It related to the deaths of three teenage girls who were burned up when their Ford Pinto was hit from behind. The prosecution charged that the Ford Company knowingly manufactured a dangerous car. Behind this story is the pressure on Ford to produce a small car to compete with imported vehicles. The Pinto was rushed into production in spite of warnings that the gas tank was in a dangerous position. It would have cost Ford an additional $11 per car to fix the problem. Ford decided not to. Later, Ford produced a cost-benefit analysis to justify their position, estimating that the faulty design would cause 180 additional deaths. Ford valued these at $200,000 per person. This cost was far less than equipping 12.5 million vehicles with $11 protectors, so Ford felt that they had made the right decision. Ford executives were acquitted on the charge of homicide. Nonetheless, Ford had to pay out millions of dollars in out-of-court settlements. These were paid to families who had lost relatives in Pinto accidents. This case shows how far a company will go to protect its profits. For more than eight years, Ford lobbied the government not to tighten safety standards on cars. As long as the Pinto was profitable, Ford did not want to change the design. Although Ford made a lot of money on the Pinto, their reputation was tarnished. The Ford Pinto case is one of many which point to the need for governments to set safety standards. No business wants to recall its products or leave them sitting idly in a warehouse or expend large sums of money for upgrading and repairs. 
No airplane company wants to have its planes in the hangar when they could be in the air making money for the corporation. As a result, commercial companies are seldom motivated to look closely at product or service safety. This is especially true today, when the bottom line in business is seen as a justification for every decision. For this reason, governments have to oversee issues of public safety. Most businesses are too busy working on profits to have much time or concern for doing so. The Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is one of the most spectacular sights in nature. It is found in one section of the valley of the Colorado River. The river begins its course high in the Rocky Mountains of the state of Colorado. The river travels a total of 1,400 miles through Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, and into the Gulf of California. It forms part of Arizona's border with Nevada and California. The Colorado River is a very swift and muddy river. It carries dirt and rocks down from the mountains. The story is told of an old fur trader who was attacked by Indians high up the river. His only escape was down the Colorado River in a small boat. It was a terrifying trip through rapids and around rocks at top speed. The fur trader was found some days later in very rough shape, hundreds of miles down the river. No one would believe that he had come so far so fast. The Grand Canyon stretches for about 250 miles in the state of Arizona. The canyon was carved out by the flow of the river itself. In places, the canyon is more than a mile deep. It stretches from four to 18 miles wide at the top. The canyon valley contains worn rocks that rise up like a mountain range. The canyon has been worn down through many layers of rock. The river has cut its way down through layers of sandstone, limestone, and shaped to the granite bedrock. The different layers are of different colors, and the rocks appear very beautiful, especially at sunrise and sunset. Because the canyon is so deep, the climate changes as you go down into the valley. At the top, the climate is typical of a mountain area with evergreen trees. Next, you have typical forest trees. Third, there are plants like cacti that grow in warm deserts. Finally, there are subtropical plants at the valley bottom. Tourists can ride down the narrow trails to the bottom of the valley on mules. On one side is the rock wall of the canyon, and on the other side is a steep drop down to the bottom. Tourists have to trust their guide and the mule that they are riding to get them down safely. The trails zigzag back and forth, and the tourist going down travels much more than a mile. Some 1,000 square miles of the area became the Grand Canyon National Park in 1919. Because the Colorado River is very swift and runs through dry country, several dams have been built along it. These are designed to harness its power, save its water, and provide recreational opportunities. The best-known dam is Hoover Dam, formerly Boulder Dam, on the Arizona-Nevada border. This impressive structure is 727 feet high and 1,282 feet long. Elevators are used to carry workers up and down inside the dam. The water, which is backed up by the Hoover Dam, forms Lake Mead. Lake Mead is used to irrigate nearby land as well as for boating and fishing. The dam itself is a major source of electric power for this section of the country. Visitors to the Grand Canyon are often filled with awe by the size and beauty of the canyon. People seem very small in comparison to the immense cliffs, valleys, and the mighty river. The Welland Canal. Before railways and automobiles became common, transporting goods over long distances was a difficult chore. In early North America, roads were often bad or non-existent. In the winter, snow and cold weather made travel difficult. Frontier farmers had trouble selling their crops because it was hard to get them to the cities. Often, rivers and lakes were the best ways to travel. Fur traders carried their furs and other supplies in canoes, but even large canoes were not big enough to hold a shipment of wheat. Rapids and waterfalls meant that goods had to be taken out of the canoe and carried to the next body of calm water. One way to improve water transportation was to build a canal. In New York State, Governor DeWitt Clinton had constructed the Erie Canal from the Niagara River to the Hudson River soon after the War of 1812. 
because relations between the United States and Canada were still not very friendly. This was another reason to build a canal on the Canadian side. Canals could be used to move supplies and troops during wartime. Sometimes the British government would forbid Canadian farmers to sell food to the USA. Without a canal to move their farm produce, crops were sometimes left to rot. A Saint Catharines, Ontario merchant named William Hamilton Merritt, thought about all these things in the 1820s. He also thought that flour mills needed a more reliable source of water to operate. Saint Catharines is on 12 Mile Creek below the Niagara Escarpment. This creek runs towards Lake Ontario. It rises above the escarpment, which stands from 150 to 300 feet high, then runs towards Lake Ontario. If Merritt could join the 12 Mile Creek to one of the rivers, which ran to Lake Erie, the canal would provide transportation and water power. The problem was to find a way to move boats up the escarpment. From 1824 to 1829, Merritt and his friends hired laborers to dig away tons of dirt and rock. Nearly all the work was done with shovels, pickaxes, horses, and wagons. In places, the ground was soft and landslides occurred. In other places, the men had to dig through solid granite rock. Merritt's main problem, however, was raising the money to pay for the construction. After sinking all the money that he, his family, and friends had into the canal, more was needed. Merritt went to Toronto, New York, and finally London, England, to get the financial support he needed. The problem of getting the boats to climb the escarpment was solved by a series of 35 wooden locks. These carried a ship 327 feet upwards. The ship would enter a lock with a small amount of water. More water would come into the lock, lifting the boat another 10 or 15 feet. Then the ship would move into the next lock and be lifted up again. Boats going in the opposite direction were lowered instead of lifted. The Welland Canal has been rebuilt three times since the first canal opened in 1829. Now, large seagoing and lake vessels cross the Niagara Peninsula from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. They carry grain, coal, iron ore. Oil and many other bulk products. The Welland Canal remains one of the most important commercial waterways in the world. Yellowstone National Park. The Rocky Mountains of North America are quite old. Even though they were very volcanic millions of years ago, only a couple were still active today. In Yellowstone National Park, however, there is a large area of land which indicates recent volcanic activity. This area contains hot springs, geysers, and mud springs. Hot springs like geysers are caused by underground water being heated by hot rocks down in the earth. This hot water is then forced to the surface. When the surface rock is soft or porous, then the hot water bubbles. Bubbles up like a spring. When the surface rock is hard, then the hot water shoots up through any hole in the rock that it can find. These spurts of hot water are called geysers. Yellowstone also contains mud pots or mud springs. These happen when the hot water is turned to steam, and the steam carries mud and clay to the surface. Yellowstone Park is high up in the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming. Very few white people went there until the 1860s. It is said that Indians avoided the area because they thought that evil spirits lived there. In 1869, three men from Montana decided to explore this remote area. They were very impressed with its natural wonders and talked about it to others. Two other exploring expeditions followed in the next two years. These visitors were so enthusiastic about the beauty and majesty of Yellowstone that they asked that it be made a national park. At that time, there was no national park system in America. Nonetheless, in 1872, the American government agreed to set aside these lands as a public park. Why were the early visitors to Yellowstone so impressed? First, the scenery is spectacular. The Yellowstone River has created its own Grand Canyon through years of eroding its rocky banks. It is the yellow color of these canyon walls that gave Yellowstone its name. The area has many waterfalls, including the 308-foot-high Lower Falls in the Yellowstone River. There are many beautiful lakes, and the largest is Yellowstone Lake. The area is rich in wildlife. Among the mammals are black bears, grizzly bears, elk, moose, mule deer, bison, bighorn sheep, coyotes, pronghorn antelope, beaver, and wolves. 
Birds, especially waterfowl, are common all year. These include the trumpeter swan, blue heron, cormorants, bald eagles, osprey, pelicans, Canada geese, and many kinds of ducks. Sport fish are also plentiful. About 80 percent of the forest consists of lodgepole pine, but there are many other evergreens. Wildflowers are numerous and varied. But the chief attractions are the geysers and hot springs. They occur in what was a very volcanic area a million years or so ago. Here, hot molten lava from the center of the Earth has remained close to the surface of the Earth. This lava heats the surface rocks, which in turn heats the underground water. The heated water shoots up to the surface as geysers or bubbles up as hot springs. The most famous geyser is Old Faithful, which shoots its plume of water 150 feet into the air every 65 minutes or so. The eruption lasts up to five minutes. There are 200 geysers in Yellowstone Park, and about 50 of them are spectacular. Some shoot their spray over 200 feet high. Visitors from all over the world are delighted that this region has been preserved as a national park. Canadian colleges and universities. Canada has about 50 accredited universities spread across 10 provinces. All except one are primarily government-funded. This means that there is considerable uniformity regarding programs, administration, and policy. Private colleges tend to be smaller and are mostly based on a religious curriculum. Most universities offer programs in the humanities, social sciences, and pure sciences. Many have additional faculties such as education and physical education. Many programs that lead directly to a position in the workplace are given at community colleges. Community colleges differ from universities because their programs involve job training and practical experience. For example, they might offer courses in areas such as computer programming, journalism, photography, social work, dentistry, and nursing. Their programs are considered to be less abstract and academic than university programs. Many students see university as being more fun than community college. They don't have to worry immediately about getting a job, and the social life is often better at university. However, a university degree may be less likely to lead directly to a job. Nowadays, university programs which are work-related, such as business administration, education, child studies, and psychology. Seem especially popular. Universities, however, were founded mainly as liberal arts institutions. This means their original intent was to prepare people to be well-rounded human beings and knowledgeable citizens. So, nearly all universities have programs in literature, languages, philosophy, culture, music, history, and politics, as well as studies that are more job-related. A past BA or BSc degree in Canada. Is normally three full years of study after secondary school. A bachelor degree with honors includes one more year of study. A master's degree is a further one or two years. A doctorate usually requires four or more years. This is similar to the United States, except that their bachelor degree is normally three years, and their master's degree may be up to three years. To gain entrance to university. You usually need to graduate from secondary school with a B average. Some programs will require an A average. Tuition costs have gone up in recent years as governments have handed over less money to colleges and universities. More students now have to work during the school year to pay their expenses. Attending college and university is known to be one of the most carefree periods in a person's life. As long as you keep up with your readings and assignments, you should be able to avoid major difficulties. Facilities for athletics, student radio and newspapers, pubs and lounges, and generally pleasant surroundings make campus life agreeable. It is a good time to make friends, learn new skills, and take calculated risks. Moreover, colleges and universities are a good practical investment as they help to prepare young people. For a changing world, medical missionary. During the reign of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901, British people traveled around the whole world. They charted the seas, mapped out distant countries, and studied plants, animals, and people. 
They also claim many lands for England. This kind of international travel was made easier by improved transportation and communication. New inventions such as steamships, trains, telegraphs, and telephones made long distances seem smaller. Of course, people had different reasons for going to distant lands. Some were businessmen who saw economic opportunities overseas. Soldiers wanted fame and a chance to enlarge the British Empire. Big game hunters wanted to be the first to shoot strange animals and bring back trophies to England. Scientists intended to study unknown animals and plants. Missionaries planned to be the first to introduce Christianity to faraway people. In 1836, a young Scotsman called David Livingstone began to study medicine in Glasgow. Livingstone intended to become a medical missionary. This means that he would be a doctor as well as a preacher and teacher. Livingstone, 1813 to 1873, came from a poor family. From an early age, he had worked 14 hours a day in a clothing factory for very little pay. But he was determined to learn. He took his books with him to the factory and read as he worked. Then, after work, he would go to his teacher to learn more. Livingston's goal was to teach faraway people about Jesus. However, unlike some missionaries, he was also interested in science, geography, and exploring. He had planned to go to China in 1839, but because of the Opium Wars, no missionaries were being sent there. Instead, he asked to go to South Africa. Europeans had traveled around the coasts of Africa for hundreds of years. But very few white people had traveled inland. A missionary named Robert Moffat, who had begun a mission at Kuriman in the interior, inspired Livingston. Livingston arrived in Kuriman in 1841. This was the farthest outpost of white settlement, and no one seemed to want to go further inland. Livingston felt that the missionaries should go to the Africans, rather than waiting for the Africans to come to them. With a fellow missionary, he set out. When they came to an African tribe, they would talk to the chief and ask permission to preach to his people. Livingston would also set up a tent and treat the people who had diseases. After a while, he would move on to the next tribe. Once Livingston learned the Bantu language, he would talk to many Africans, but sometimes he needed interpreters. There were many diseases, including malaria and sleeping sickness. Livingston suffered much of his life from river fever. He was also so weak that he rode on the back of an ox. Livingston wanted to stop the slave trade. At this time, the slave trade was the most profitable business in Africa. Livingston hoped that if other kinds of trade were developed, then slavery could be abolished. In order to open up trade, he wanted to find an easy route into the center of Africa. Livingston kept going further into the interior. He was probably the first European to cross the Kalahari Desert before reaching Lake Nagami in present-day Botswana. Not long after, he traveled further inland. He explored the sources of the Zambezi and Kansai rivers, and eventually reached the west coast of Africa and Luanda, Angola. Livingston was being criticized for neglecting missionary work in order to explore. Livingston replied that he was opening up the continent for missionaries. Meanwhile, he was becoming famous as a great explorer. The British government commissioned him to explore the Zambezi River. They hoped that ships could sail up the river into the interior. Unfortunately, the Zambezi had too many rapids. However, Livingston did find a route up the Shire River to Lake Nyasa. He continued to struggle against the slave trade, which is now being taken over by Arabs. Livingston died in Africa in 1873. He was the first white man to explore Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and surrounding areas. He was not only a great explorer, but also a fine doctor and a good missionary. Nowadays, the countries that Livingston visited are nearly all Christian, just as he had hoped they would be. Florence Nightingale. It could be said that Florence Nightingale was responsible for inventing modern nursing. Indeed, Nightingale did open up the professions to women generally. Her example and influence during the mid to late 19th century were an important factor in opening doors to women. 
Nightingale's own life reflects many of these changes. She was born in 1820 and was one of two daughters of a wealthy English family. Her mother was a beautiful society lady who had once turned down a favored suitor because he was not wealthy enough. She wanted both her daughters to be socially popular and to marry rich and important men. Florence's father ensured that she had a good education, but she was frustrated because girls and women were always under parental supervision. She felt called to a life of action, but her family insisted that she divide her time between being with her family and attending social functions. She was not allowed to do anything on her own. When she was sixteen, Nightingale said that God spoke to her and called her to do His work. But Florence didn't know what work she was being called to do. Years passed away while she sat with her mother and sister, or attended dances and concerts, or traveled to Europe. Nightingale became more angry and rebellious. She offended her family and friends by refusing to marry several prominent men who wanted to marry her. By the time she was twenty-four, she had decided to be a nurse. But how did one become a nurse? At that time, the profession didn't seem promising. The only respectable nurses were those women in religious orders that ministered to the patient's spiritual health, but were not trained in medicine. The majority of nurses were poor, untrained women who were suspected of being too fond of men or alcohol or both. In fact, one hospital preferred to hire unwed mothers as nurses because they had no reputations to lose. Nightingale's family was horrified by her plans. Their opposition delayed her plans, but could not stop them. In 1850, she visited a hospital in Germany for the first time. In 1853, she was appointed superintendent of a women's nursing home in London. But Florence was still waiting for her true calling. In 1855, the Times of London was printing reports from the Crimean War. France and England were fighting Russia in the Crimean Peninsula. After one Allied victory, the wounded French soldiers were well taken care of, but the wounded English soldiers were left to die. Back in England, there was a public outcry. It was Florence's opportunity. She was soon on her way to Istanbul, Turkey, with thirty-eight nurses. Scutari, Turkey, was the hospital where the British wounded were brought. This so-called hospital was a death pit, where forty-two out of every one hundred men died. The army was unwilling to listen to Miss Nightingale or to let her tend the wounded. She had to wait until conditions became so bad that the regular medical officers were overwhelmed. As soon as the army turned to her, she immediately went to work. She had the entire hospital cleaned, a new kitchen set up, and a good water supply obtained. The death rate dropped to twenty-two out of every one thousand. Nightingale became famous overnight. Although her efforts in the Crimean War injured her health, she continued her work back in London. She published a 1,000-page report on medical conditions in the British Army, several books on nursing, and her own proposals and suggestions. She also set up a training school for nurses. Long before her death in 1910, she had seen nursing become a well-established profession. Almost single-handedly, she had helped to bring about proper treatment of the sick and injured. Hernias repaired here. A hernia occurs when there is a tear or weakness in the muscle layers of the abdomen. This allows the intestines to push forward into the gap. Usually, the person feels some discomfort and may notice an egg-shaped swelling. In a few cases, the muscle layers may clamp down on the protruding intestine and cut off its oxygen supply. This can result in death if medical help is not readily available. Hernias are more common in men than women. And are often related to lifting heavy materials. Although most hernias are not a serious threat to health, they usually get worse over time. The only cure is surgery to repair the cut, tear, or weakness. As with any surgery, time in a hospital is usually required for recovery. This proved to be a problem in Canada during World War II. Many young men were declared unfit for military service because they had hernias. 
During the war, there was a shortage of doctors and beds for hernia repair. A Toronto doctor, Dr. Edward Scholdice, decided to address this problem. He personally operated on 70 of these young men using a technique of his own. This Scholdice technique allowed the patients a quicker recovery time than the usual method. It also had a much lower rate of complications and failures. After the war, Dr. Scholdice opened his own hernia clinic for the public. In 1953, a second hospital was started in Thornhill, just north of Toronto, and today all surgery is done there. The Scholdice Hospital is located on a beautiful piece of land with a valley on one side and a golf course on the other. The large grounds have wonderful gardens and flowering trees. There are nature paths for patients to walk on. The building itself is not a regular hospital, but more like a hotel or residence where patients can play the piano, shoot pool, play shuffleboard, or practice their putting. The hospital now has 89 beds, and an average of 30 hernia operations are performed daily. Since all the surgeons are specialists, their level of skill is very high, and less than 1% of operations need to be corrected. The worldwide rate of failure is around 20%. For patients, the good news is that everything at the hospital is directed to repairing their hernia and aiding their recovery as quickly as possible. The staff encourages its patients to walk and exercise within four or five hours of surgery. Patients usually stay on for several more days until they are fully recovered and ready to go home. Scholdice's best advertisements are his satisfied customers. Hernia patients come not only from Canada and the United States, but also from many countries of the world to receive the best possible treatment. Scholdice remains the most famous hospital in the world, devoted entirely to the repair and treatment of hernias. Potato Chips and Corn Chips the story goes that the potato chip was invented in Saratoga Springs, New York in 1853. Multimillionaire Cornelius Vanderbilt complained to the chef that his fried potatoes were sliced too thickly. Chef George Crum responded by slicing the potatoes paper thin and frying them in hot oil. The potato chip became an instant success. Many companies have made large profits on chips. The most successful brands are associated with the Frito-Lay Company. Herman W. Lay of Nashville, Tennessee was selling potato chips from the back of his car in the early 1930s. He soon became a successful distributor for a brand of potato chips which were made in Atlanta, Georgia. When that company ran into financial problems, Lay arranged to buy them out. It now became H. W. Lay & Company. Meanwhile in Texas, Elmer Doolin was trying to sell chips made from corn dough. This was an old Mexican recipe which Doolin had found in San Antonio, Texas. At first, these Fritos corn chips were made in Mr. Doolin's mother's kitchen. It took a few years before they sold very well. Mr. Doolin moved the company to Dallas and began to expand his market. In 1945, he granted the H.W. Lay Company the rights to make Fritos corn chips for the American Southeast. In 1961, the two companies merged to become Frito-Lay Incorporated. In 1965, Frito-Lay merged with Pepsi to become PepsiCo Incorporated, one of the largest snack food and beverage companies in the world. In 2000, Frito-Lay sold 58% of all the snack chips in the USA. In Canada and the United States, Frito-Lay products had sales of $9.9 .9 billion. The most popular brand was Lay's Potato Chips, followed by Doritos, Ruffles, Tostitos, Cheetos, and Fritos. Internationally, Frito-Lay has 28% of the market worldwide. That amounts to $5.9 billion annually. Why are potato chips and corn chips so popular? Well, they are versatile. You can eat them by themselves or with a sandwich for lunch. They can replace other forms of potatoes and corn. They can also come in various flavors. For example, potato chip flavors include ketchup, salt and vinegar, barbecue, dill pickle, and cheddar.
Potato chips can be thick or thin, ridged or flat, spicy or bland. Chips can be made from many things besides potatoes. There is corn dough and tortilla dough, of course. But chips can also be made from sweet potatoes, parsnips, taro root, peppers, and other vegetables. One caution about potato chips is that they are not a good source of nutrition. Parents who send their children to school with a bag of potato chips for lunch need to remember that these are just a snack, because snack chips usually contain a lot of fat. They can also lead to weight gain. It is better not to eat snack chips too often. And not to eat them instead of healthier foods. In Canada, nearly two billion dollars is spent on snack foods every year, and half of this is spent on chips. People are always looking for new flavors to try. Spicy chips are gaining in popularity. The snack chip industry just keeps on growing. The two cultures. In 1956, English writer and scientist C.P. Snow wrote an essay on the two cultures. By this, he meant that in the West there's a scientific culture and a literary culture. Scientists do not talk very much to literary men, and vice versa. Neither group seems to know or want to know very much about the other. Snow argues that the scientific people and the literary people are moving further and further apart. Few scientists or engineers read literature. Very few writers or intellectuals know or care anything about science. This, Snow thinks, is a major problem in the world today. Literary culture seems to be anti-science and anti-technology. This affects Western reluctance to train more scientists and engineers. The standard of living in the West and throughout the world depends on having scientists and engineers. Nonetheless, relatively little effort is given to encouraging and developing these areas of education. Westerners who are part of the literary culture do not encourage or understand the scientific revolution. As a result, they are insensitive to the desire of third world peoples to improve their lives through technology. Snow talks about how the standard of living in England has improved since 1800. Snow's grandfather did not go far in school, but he did learn to read and write. Living in 1900, he realized that he was better off than his grandfather, who lived in the early 1800s. Snow's great great grandfather was a farm laborer who didn't know how to read or write. Snow feels that a similar transformation could happen even in very poor countries. It could happen in a short time if the West supplied capital and engineers. Snow believes that this is the industrial revolution that has transformed the West. This is what has allowed the farm laborers to go on to school and to learn employable skills. In 1800, only a small portion of society could expect to live well. Now, nearly everyone has access to education and training. The same industrial revolution can happen in third world countries. It is the only way to improve the lot of the poor. Snow agrees that most scientists and engineers do not read novels or cultivate the arts. However, he doesn't consider this to be as dangerous as when literary people ignore science and technology. Science and technology are too important to our standard of living to be ignored. Our education systems have to be changed to reflect our need of them. Snow's article was quite controversial. Not everyone agreed with him that science and technology are being ignored by our educational system, but Snow certainly has a point when he says that scientific people and literary people view the world differently. These two different mindsets often lead to conflict in the workplace. Snow may be right that it is too easy for literary-minded students to ignore science and scientifically-minded students to ignore literature.